find in Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter, Harrison's over there trying to catch a jumping spider. Luke chapter number one. He done got into spirit, amen? <laughs> done got into, we've been praying for you, Harrison. You get that sooner or later. Luke chapter number one. I don't care where you go, you won't find any better music than what you find right here at Blue Ridge View. Luke chapter number one. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject, Raising Soldiers for the Savior Service. I had no idea what Diana was going to sing this morning, but uh, I battled all week. You can ask my wife. I battled all week, especially late in the week, about what I would be sharing this morning. I had intended to be in uh, Revelation chapter 2, uh, preaching on the church at Ephesus and leaving our first love. But uh, the Lord just really worked on me, especially in the night last night. And I was up here early this morning getting some things together. And uh, so uh, let's pray that God would move and that He would minister in our midst. I want you to stand in honor and reverence to the reading of God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. Raising soldiers for the Savior's service. I tell you what, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 13. And then we'll go back, we'll go back and look uh, at verses 5 through 12 as we make our way through the, through the message. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Our Father, we pray now as we look into your word, I pray that we would be just as excited about the message as we are about the music today. Lord, I pray that you would only use me as a vessel. Lord, to share your word, we don't make it up, we just deliver it. And Father, I pray right now, all over this building, I pray that, that we will prepare our hearts to hear what you have to say to us this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Uh, I told the early service, the family in our text this morning is one of the most interesting families in all of Scripture. Uh, outside the family of Mary and Joseph and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe this family is probably one of the greatest families recorded in Scripture. It is said about each member of this family, Zacharias the father, Elizabeth the mother, John the son, it is said that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, from the outside looking in, you and I would probably, we would probably view the future of this young man as not very promising. He, he's the son of elderly parents. As far as we can tell from the Word of God, he's an only child. He seemed to have some difficulty in relating to people, and he spent many years in what you and I would call a wilderness experience. As a matter of fact, he spent time in the wilderness. Uh, he was an unusual person. John the Baptist had a strange kind of diet. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go after church today and order locust and wild honey. Amen? He had an unusual diet. He, he was dressed in a funny kind of way. And so he was, in every way, just an unusual person. You and I would say today, because we use this terminology, we use this phrase, you and I would say this morning that John the Baptist was socially awkward. He was just kind of socially awkward. He rarely could relate to people in such a way as to not get them upset. In fact, he had a run-in with a politician, and he made that politician so mad, the result was... John the Baptist lost his head. He was beheaded at an early age. Now, I would be interested this morning to know what the sociologists or the psychologists or the theologians of our day would have to say about this young man's life. 
I'd be interested to know what they would say about uh, uh, the potential of his life as he moved on, whether or not he would amount to much in this life. But did you know the Lord Jesus Christ, in speaking of this young man, he said that of those who had been born of women, there was not one greater than he. Obviously, this morning we're referring to John the Baptist, not John the disciple, not John who wrote the Gospel of John in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the book of Revelation. We're not talking about that John. They're two separate Johns. We're talking this morning about John the Baptist. The, uh, some in the Bible called him John the Baptizer. Now here's the lesson. I, I suppose this could be a, a, a capsule of what the message is really about this morning. And by the way, I will not have enough time to finish this message this morning. And so I want you to commit right now to being back tonight because you will miss the truth of this entire message if you don't hear the last two points tonight. So I want you to make sure that you're back tonight. But here, here's the lesson. John the Baptist tells us that regardless of the problems and the pressures, our young people, our young adults, Regardless of the problems they may face, it is possible for our young people to make a difference in this world for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is possible. It is possible for them to win at life. It is possible for them to overcome any obstacle and to stand strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is possible. Listen to me this morning, Blue Ridge View, because this is a message to the church about our young people. Listen, it is possible for them to hold fast to their convictions when they move off and go to college. When they move out of the house and get involved in their career. It is possible for them to hold fast to their values as they face this world on their own. It, it is no secret. You've been here, uh, I've been here almost 20 years. It is no secret, and you know this, that I love children. I love children. I told, I told my first service, uh, I love children so much, I had two of them myself. Amen? I mean, I love children. I love young people. I love being around young adults. I, I have an affinity. I, I re, I'm drawn to 18 to 25, 26 year olds. I just love to be around them. I love to hang out with them. I love to hear what they have to say. I even like to try to keep up with them. I got a son and some nephews, man. I want to do everything they do. I, I just want to hang out with them. And, and sometimes they don't want an old fogey with them. You know what I mean? But I'm particularly drawn to that age group. But I do not have my head in the sand this morning. And I'm aware that our young people today are facing an uphill battle in this generation. They're struggling. Our young people are searching. I want you to listen to the reality this morning. I, I read these statistics several years ago. Did you know every 24 hours, 3,000 kids see their parents get divorced? 1,629 kids are put in adult jails. In the next 24 hours, 3,288 kids will run away from home. 1,512 will drop out of school. And 7,742 kids in the next 24 hours will become sexually active. Our young people today have adult problems. You hear what I just said? Young people today have adult problems. The problems our, our young people face each day are taking their toll. I, I wrote down uh, at least three, at least three adverse reactions that our young people are having today due to the problems that, that they face. Number one, I want you to write this down. Number one, because of the problems that, that our young people are facing today, our young adults are facing today, uh, the first adverse reaction is this, depression. Depression. There is an onslaught of emotional di distress that is attacking our young people. And you know what? Listen, just, just, by, uh, just as a side note, a lot of experts believe that one of the major causes of depression among teens is due to parents divorcing. 
They have a fear of abandonment. They're going through all these emotions anyway, becoming teenagers, moving from adolescent into, into teenage years. And, and then they, they go to college. They're moving out and, and things like that. And they already have all these emotions, hormones and everything that, that's affecting them. Then mom and dad, for, for whatever reason, can't work it out. They see them divorce and they, they get this fear of abandonment. A lot of them have a guilt that their behavior somehow has caused the divorce to occur. And so they've got all these anxieties, they've got all these insecurities, and, and they just become depressed. Listen to this. Do you know that 2.1 million children ages 1 to 17, 2.1 million as of 2017, have been prescribed an antidepressant? Second adverse reaction due to the problems they're facing is addiction. Addiction. Our, our young people in mass are becoming addicted to drugs and alcohol. Survey done. I want you to listen, parents. Survey was done several years ago about kids and teenagers drinking. The survey said, the survey they did it with parents first, uh, the parents, 87%, almost 9 out of 10 parents said they believe that teens drink and do drugs simply because everybody else is doing it. But when they surveyed the kids, almost 7 out of 10 of those kids said they do it to help them forget their problems. By age 15, 33% had experience with alcohol. By the age of 18, 60% have used it. 50% of seniors have taken or smoked an illicit drug. 37% of those are 10th graders. 23% are 8th graders. Parents, I want to ask you something this morning. Have you taken the time to look around uh, social media lately and just kind of check up on your, your child? Say, preacher, I can't do that. That's an invasion of privacy. Get out of here. Good night a lot. Most of you paying for your child's cell phone, you ought to be able to look at anything. I, I, I got back from preaching this morning. Hey, there's my mom and dad. I got back from preaching this morning. Stacy had been in my office during the early service. I got... She had been going through my text messages. Did you find anything scandalous on there? Hey, listen, listen. You ought, you ought to check up a little bit. You ought to look around see what's going on with your teenagers. Look at me right here. Some of you might be surprised this morning. That's all I'm going to say. And then number three. The third adverse reaction to the problems our kids are facing today is aggression. Violence. There's an incredible amount of violence going on today in our culture among young people. I want you to listen to what one writer had to say about this, and I quote. He said, kids are killing, they're dying, they're bleeding. America is in the midst of a raging epidemic of juvenile homicide, suicide, and abuse. End of quote. Read a newspaper article uh, entitled, Child's Killing, the Shame of Society. It's about a killing that occurred in Middleton, Delaware several years ago. A nine-year-old boy was murdered by a 15-year-old boy. It says that nine-year-old disappeared, but a week later, Stephen was found dead in a drainage ditch just a mile from his home. He had been raped, beaten with a log, and drowned. The boy, 15 years old, had tried to choke Stephen to death. 15-year-old boy's name was Lamont. He confessed after his muddy jeans were found in a trash can at the apartment. One of the neighbors made this statement, and I quote, he said, this is the shame of our society. The children don't have the time to enjoy their childhood, a protected childhood. They are handed the horrors of society on a dirty plate. End of quote. Aggression. Violence among boys and girls. Blue Ridge View, please hear my heart this morning. I've been burned about this all week long and in the last several weeks. Our young people are a gift from God. 
our preschool, our children, our youth, our college age, our young adults. They are a gift from God. And it is a gift that we better treasure. It is a gift that we better handle with care. It's a gift that we better take care of. Do you know, when you read the gospel, do you know that Jesus loved kids? Jesus loved children. The Bible tells us uh, over there that uh, boys and girls came to Jesus. The disciples thought they were so important. They'd been doing all these things and following Jesus around as He taught and carrying out some, some ministry for Jesus. They thought they were so important that they were too busy to handle these little kids and to deal with them. And so they said, Jesus, send them away. Let, let's don't deal with them right now. Just get them out of the way. And I believe, as I read, I believe Jesus with a voice of rebuke he said, permit the little children to come unto me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. And the Bible says he took those little children. He, he placed them on his lap. He touched them. And then the Bible says he blessed those children. You know what? It is so important. While we have our young people here at the most, at the most three to four hours a week, while we have them here, we need to fill them full of the Word of God. We need to take seriously our responsibility to minister to our young people from the cradle to college to career. And in the days to come, listen to me, Blue Ridge, I'm going to scare some of you to death, but in the days to come, we need to commit more than ever to reach our children and train our children in the things of God. Amen. Friend, my vision has not changed. God still puts some more things in my heart. Some more things in my heart for Blue Ridge View. Everybody look at me. I don't know if you've been to the preschool wing lately. We need better facilities. We need better facilities for our preschoolers. I think uh, Judy told me in our staff meeting Wednesday night, she had 18 out there uh, in that little preschool area. 18 last Sunday. Uh, we need to do better with our facilities. Our preschool ministry here should not be a babysitting service. It should be a care ministry. We need better facilities in order to minister to and train our children the way that we need to. We've got facilities for most everybody else. Our, our children need a, a, a place to call their own. Friend, you would be astounded to know the capacity that little boys and little girls have uh, to retain Scripture and to learn the things of God. I told the early service, Miss Debbie's class is a prime example of those uh, fourth and fifth grade girls in there. And she teaches them Scripture. They memorize that Scripture. Now they may get a Reese's Cup to memorize that Scripture. I would too, Miss Debbie. Let's make it a honey bun. We need to do a better job of ministering to our college students and our young single adults. It takes people with a passion to do that. I want to read you something. I talked to two young men this week, somewhere around the ages of 22 to 24, that really got my attention and burdened me in a great, great way. I want to read you a little bit of this and I'm going to say something about it later, but why young adults leave the church is one of the most vexing questions facing the church today. A 2007 Lifeway Christian Resources survey indicated that 70% of 18 to 22 year olds stop attending church for at least one year. Furthermore, Barna surveys have repeatedly shown that a majority of 20 year olds leave the church never to return. You say, preacher, it's because the church down the street's got better programs. Preacher, it's because they don't like our music. They like music somewhere else. Are you, did you just listen to that? And I hope you heard what I prayed a while ago. I just want you to know, we're not, we're not going to design a service to attract a crowd. We're going to design a service, first and foremost, to attract God. Amen? But listen to me. Listen. They're not... They may not want to hear a preacher like me get, get to hollering and get excited. But listen, even if they do go down the street because they want a better building or they, they want a better uh, ministry, more excitement, whatever the case may be, the fact still remains 
that they leave and they never come back. So it's not the church. It's something else. In, in our student ministry, we desire, listen, listen to me, in our student ministry, we desire to be discipleship driven as opposed to activity driven. We do activities. We have fun. But I want Adam teaching them the Word of God. Our goal is to raise up soldiers for the Savior. And listen, we don't just want to teach them what they should believe. We want to teach them why they should believe it. And we want to teach them to articulate their faith. Too long, too long. We have simply had Bible studies, Wednesday night studies, Sunday night studies, and we've taught our young people, young people, don't drink, don't smoke, don't have sex before marriage. We've told them all that, but have we told them why not to do that? God forbid that my two children would go out into the world one day and somebody say, well, why do you believe like that? Why do you have those convictions? God forbid they'd say, well, I guess because my daddy told me. I guess because that's what I've always been taught. Now, that, that might be a pretty good reason but I want them to be able to say, well, I'll tell you why I believe that. It's because God put a conviction in my heart based on His Word. Here's what I find in the Word of God, which is the authority and practice of my life. Here's what God's Word says about this. And I live like this. I have these convictions because I know the Word of God is true. Here's what will happen if I don't abide by these convictions. And this is what God's Word says. And they can articulate their faith. Not just what we believe. Why we believe it. Going a little slower than the early service, I'm sorry. Our goal in our student ministry is to instill within our high schoolers and our middle schoolers sound biblical convictions and values. And then teach them how to put those convictions and values into practice when they graduate and go off to college or get into a career, we need to teach them to be bold and courageous and we need to teach them to be soul winners for Almighty God. Teddy Roosevelt made one of the greatest statements I've ever heard. Teddy Roosevelt said, if you educate a child in mind and not in morals, you're just educating a menace to society. I am passionate that we instill within boys and girls at an early age the truth of God's Word. Build within them strong convictions so their conduct will be the conduct of a soldier in the Savior's service. Well, preacher, how do we do that? How do, how do, we, how do we grow our young people into warriors for Christ in, in the culture in which we live? Well, one point this morning, and we'll finish tonight, so you need to be back tonight. Number one, here, here's the main thing. Understand that the parents have a divine responsibility got a divine responsibility. John the Baptist had a wonderful, remarkable family. You'll notice in chapter 1 and verse 6, go back up to verse 6, we're told that both his mother and his father were righteous before God. Walking in the commandments and ordinances before the Lord, blameless. You know what that tells me? It tells me, first of all, mom and dad were saved. They were, they were people of righteousness, God's righteousness. John the Baptist had the privilege of a mother and a father who knew the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Before I go any further, dad, mom, grandparent, the greatest thing any father can give his children, the greatest thing any mother can give to her children is to know Jesus Christ and to pass that faith along. Amen? So if you're in here this morning and you've never invited Christ to, to come into your life and be Savior and Lord of your life, I am praying right now, this church is praying that before you leave this service, you come down to this altar and you trust Christ as your personal Savior. The greatest gift you could ever give your children, the greatest gift that will ever come into your home is giving your heart to Jesus Christ. Second of all, here's what I figured out from this text. Mom and dad weren't just saved. They were serious about their salvation. And this is where we're missing it today. They were serious about it. Look at verse 13. 
But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. John was a boy who was born into a family in an answer to prayer. Let me tell you something, my friend. Every baby deserves to have a mom and dad who love them enough to pray for them and to pray over them. How important and how awesome it is to pray for our boys and girls. Here was a family that were saved and they were serious about their salvation. But a third thing I notice about them is this, according to verse number 15, mom and dad were separated from this world. Look at verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. When you read about John the Baptist, you find the predictions about his coming were that he would be great in the sight of the Lord. He wouldn't drink strong drink. He would be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, John the Baptist was a Nazarite according to verse 15. That just means that his father and his mother, from the time of his birth, they recognized that he was a special child. And I want you to hear me this morning. Every child is special. Every young man and young lady in here today is special in the eyes of God. I want you to think with me about the example of his father. John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was a priest in the temple. Don't you know Zachariah would come home at his regular interval, intervals from the temple? Don't you think, because a lot of dads do this, don't you think that he would share with the family what he had seen in Jerusalem? And like a lot of boys do when John the Baptist got old enough. He probably wanted to go to work with daddy. He probably wanted to follow his daddy and he would go in there in that temple and he would see those symbolic robes of the priest. And I can just hear uh, Zechariah saying, John, do you see all these sacrifices? John, one of these days, your cousin from Nazareth is going to come. He's going to be the Savior of the world. He'll die for the sins of the world and he will fulfill everything these sacrifices promise at night. At night, surely John the Baptist went out with his father. Just, just father and son times, burning in the barrel, talking a little bit. And his father would say, Son, you see those lights? You see those lights in the distance? John, one day your cousin, Jesus, is going to be the light of the world. Early in the morning as the stars would come up, John and his daddy might have got up to go hunting and it, right, right before daylight. And you could see all those stars in the expanse of the sky. And don't you know, Zechariah said, John, do you see those stars? One day, your cousin Jesus, he's going to come and he'll begin his ministry and they will call him the bright and the morning star. Daddy taught John the Baptist. But think about the example of his mother. You know how mamas are. They love to get their kids up in their lap, read them Bible stories. Don't you know John's mama taught him? Put him up in his lap. And I told the early service this, and I hope I don't embarrass them, but Stacy, I, I remember when Harrison was little. And like all kids, Harrison would fight sleep around that two and three year age period. He'd fight sleep. Didn't want to go to sleep. And I can see it in my mind. I vividly remember Stacy sitting in an old blue rocker rocking back and forth singing to Harrison. Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary. You know what? That's what mamas do. They teach their kids the things of to be a Nazarite meant that John was, was a special boy. It meant that he was to live a life of separation, a different kind of life. Listen to me this morning. We have a responsibility. We've got a family responsibility to teach our kids that they're different, that they are special, and that they are wonderful. Every child in here today, I don't care how old they are, they need to know that God has a fabulous and God has a wonderful plan for their life. They need to know that Jesus makes the difference in a life. Our young people need to know that there's joy in living for
for Jesus. And my friend, there is joy in living for Jesus. And we ought to not just tell them that, we ought to show them with our life. Friend, the worst advertisement for a Christian is an unhappy one. Our young people ought to see that we're saved, that we're serious about our Christianity and that we are separated from the sinful allurements of this world. Here's the thing this morning. I'm going to close. Here's the thing this morning. Dad, if you want to raise a potential alcoholic, and you have alcohol in your home, drink a little bit. Daddy, if you want to raise a potential porn addict, then you keep looking at it on your phone. You keep watching it on cable TV. You keep ordering the magazines trying to hide him. Sooner or later, sooner or later, he's going to find it. Mom, if you want to raise a young lady that lives for things, 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 then you just buy her everything she wants. And you do it in excess. Mom, if you want to raise a young lady that's a busybody and a gossip, then just let her continue to listen if that's who you are. But if you want to raise a soldier for Christ, if you want to raise a warrior for Jesus, if you want to raise a humble yet bold Christian in the service of the Lord, then you make much of Jesus. Make much of Jesus in your home. Make much of Jesus. Set the example. That is our divine responsibility. We are failing our young people today. Listen to me, Dad. Sometimes we care more about their golf swing than we do sitting down and teaching them about Almighty God. Sometimes we care more about their baseball game or their football game than we care about getting together around a family altar and a family devotion, hearing our kids pray for them, leading them in Bible study. And you're looking at one preacher that says, Oh me, when I get around to the family altar. Let's make much of Jesus. Let's set the example. That's our divine responsibility. Could I ask you something this morning? Everybody look at me. Are you saved today? Saved is a good old Bible word. Do you know Christ is your personal Savior? Say, preacher, I, I don't believe that I do. Preacher, I, I don't even think that a person can really know that. Yes, you can. You can know that you're saved. The other John said in 1 John, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. So you can know. Say, preacher, I, I, I have never confessed my sin to God, cried out to Him and asked Him to forgive me of my sin, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I've never done that. Good news. You can do it this morning. Just a moment after I pray and have everyone stand and they begin to play a hymn of invitation, I'm going to invite you to come. The Lord Jesus Christ is inviting you to come. The Holy Spirit of God is dealing with your heart this morning, calling you to come to Jesus. You can do that in a moment. Could I ask you something this morning? You say, preacher, I'm saved. Everybody look at me. Well, are you serious about your Christianity? We need to get serious. They're only going to do as much as we do for the most part. Are you living a separated life? Separated from the allurements of this world? You know, sometimes we think that means following a bunch of rigid rules. Sometimes we think that means that we focus on don't, don't, don't. Now, I'm, I'm not saying anything bad about this, but I always love to go to our fellowship hall. And some of the rules in our fellowship hall, I love this one, Mom and Dad. Don't play cards in the fellowship hall. I done broke that rule. I'm sorry. I ain't gamble, but I played cards. Sometimes, sometimes we focus too much on what not to do. Man, when you get full of Jesus and there's joy in serving Jesus, you're looking for things to do for Him. You won't focus on the don'ts because if you're so full of God and you're so full of Jesus and you're surrendered to Him, man, you're going to be looking for ways to glorify Him, which is why you were created anyway. You're going to be looking for ways to honor Him with your life. And all the don'ts will take care of themselves. Are you serving? Are you serving Jesus? Saved you? Bring your family to the altar this morning. I'll 
finished tonight. Every head bowed, every eye.